A lot of our clients come to us and they know, they know what they want. They want a Robert Amstern signature building. They might want something very traditional that fits into the neighborhood and it's very iconic and we're known for that. What's wonderful about New York is that it has the best collection of uh, tall residential buildings built before World War II, anywhere in the world. And we have this uh, encyclopedia of wonderful buildings uh, that we can look at and learn from. And, uh, and, and we love that history so much that what we don't want to do is sort of throw it out and do a building and sort of say that we just want to start all over again. What we see is that the, the urban fabric of the city is wonderful. So we, we like to think that we're building on, building on the traditions of the city, growing from its history, as opposed to doing something that's opposed to it. Uh, this project is called Heart of Lake, and it is in the city of Xiamen in China, and it is a two million square foot master plan. We had looked at an island called Gulong Island, which is right off of the island of Xiamen. So there's a mixture of European and Chinese influences there, and it's all fit into this almost medieval Chinese city fabric. Okay, so this is 520 Park Avenue, and the base of the building uh, has a townhouse scale. And then we, we focus on detailing all these elements, like how you do the, how you articulate the base and the shaft, and how do you make a very iconic top. This project is the Audley Square House in London in Mayfair. Of course, Mayfair is one of the most historic and desirable residential neighborhoods in the world and uh, the assignment was to create a residential building on the site of a former parking garage. The history of the, of the place and the DNA of the architecture is very much grounded in the classical tradition, specifically in the Georgian tradition. One of the things that we thought should be, was important to us to bring into this is what was learned in the early part of the 20th century in the City Beautiful movement of urban planning in the United States and in England. And one of the great examples of that in New York, one of the best examples maybe anywhere, is Forest Hills Gardens. There's a wonderful plaza, there are little apartment buildings here, and there are gateways, and then you go out to the houses. And one of the wonderful things about this project is that even though it's low rise, there's a, there's a hierarchy of buildings that goes from a kind of a more dense town center to sort of looser areas around the edges. It's just a great example. We want people to be able to walk through and discover things. We want people to come back two or three or four times and always see something new. So with that idea, we developed this master plan. If you think about the Upper East Side and the taller buildings on the avenues and the, the low scale buildings on the side streets, and much of New York is laid out that way, this was very much influenced by that. But we also want to put ourselves inside the master plan. We want to know what it's going to feel like to be in these streets. It's one of the most important things we think to architecture or to urban planning. Is you can't just look at it from the air or even in a computer. That we, we start hand sketching. And this is just an example of a little hand sketch that we did early on of one of the side streets. So there are all kinds of things going on here that we could come up with very quickly in a hand sketch, and then we work back and forth between the program requirements and the goals, the visual goals that we've established for ourselves here. And here, by the way, is, is a rougher sketch, and this was, uh, this is, uh, and this is an example of a change in the program, by the way. We thought that these would be more connected townhouses originally. 
our clients came back and said, no, we're going to get more money for single family houses. So, uh, so this is more connected. But you can see that some of these early ideas that we had about porches at the top where we thought where the master bedrooms would be in, so you'd walk out of your master bedroom and you'd have a lovely outside terrace, that's, that's still here. This is a diagram of the plan that you see right here of these three blocks of houses facing out to the water. And this diagram is very important to us because what, what we did is we decided that these should be divided up in such a way that the streets got views straight out to the water and that the views were not blocked by these blocks. And then beyond that, then we start to develop sketches like these. And this is that front entrance, which grew out of this little drawing down here. This drawing, which about, that is a very clear indication early on that we had a lot of wall and fewer windows and a charming pavilion in the middle. We ended up with something really quite similar to that here. This drawing is telling you a lot that may be not immediately clear as you look at it, but this drawing was essential in determining what this villa would become later. What, what often happens is that we'll, we'll do a drawing like this and we'll think to ourselves, what did we lose? What happened here? And we go back to the original drawing and we say, oh, well, we forgot about this and this and this, and all these things that sort of just flow out of your hand very easily and because it's your mind sort of connect, uh, communicating directly through your hand in a way that you're, not, you're hardly even thinking about it. We think you need to have the vision from the start. You need to have a sense of where you're going. You know, you need, to have, you need to have a big idea. And it's rare that we have to throw out our big idea. After we come up with shapes, we move from hand sketches to three-dimensional digital models. And then we print out images, and then we, and then we work on those images by hand. We would take an image like this, and I look at this and I sort of, I think this wall looks really dull. And I would say that, you know, these arches don't look big enough. That I would, you know, I'd want these arches to be bigger because I think the, blank, the wall is just too blank. One issue is the design of the buildings themselves, and another issue is what happens in between the buildings, these tall towers. So this just indicates that as we were looking at these tall buildings, uh, we, were all, we were thinking about the spaces in between them from the very start and the geometries of the spaces. So it's setting up, it's a kind of a scenographic idea or a cinematic idea. So I grew up watching all these Fred Astaire and Ginger Roger movies and, and I always think about those wonderful scenes with Fred and Ginger dancing on a terrace looking over Central Park. And so I, I thought this is the direction. I felt like Bob, he's academic, but he's going in the direction that I like. So I knew I wanted to come here. And it was the movies that originally inspired me. Any project has a kit of parts. So then we also look at precedence. How big is a townhouse here? How big is a point tower? In order to, uh, when we first start to play with this kit of parts, uh, we like to make that kit of parts out of clay. And we use this, it's, it's, it's plasticine clay, it's very old fashioned, and it's very oily and it gets all over you. You can take a knife and you can sort of, you know, cut a roof out, it's really easy. You know, it's like sketching three dimensionally. You can chop off something like this, and so that there's a, a, you know, maybe a low scale and a tall scale. We, also, we often use sticks like this to sort of create like a sense of windows and then you can just chop out a roof or you can sort of put it down you can start to use the clay to make little walls this is a very sort of ancient architectural tool and we we love it and we use it all the time no matter how complex our products are we usually start with with clay the reason we start with a clay model is because it's very easy to manipulate it, to try different ideas, to cut it up and move pieces around. As we can look at this right away, you could sort of say, does that feel right? Or maybe, you know, I need to chop off a little more over here. And it's so easy and you get an instant result and somebody can disagree with you and they can say, no, stick it back on and it doesn't really work. When I first started working with Paul, I used to say like, you're going to kill me, but what about, let's look at this. You still say that. I still say that. <laughs> What's really important to us is a sort of a direct connection between what you're thinking and your hand and what you're creating. So, and I think maybe that leads us to, well, what do you do when you design a big tower? Yeah, which is, it's complicated. We're always giving the zoning envelope. It pushes you in a certain direction, like whether your top's going to be like symmetrical and iconic on all four sides, or whether it's just going to be viewed from two sides and it has a different kind of massing. That helps come with the big idea, just like the zoning envelope and what you can do within it. 
We start out with the notion that we want a small, a, some kind of small scale at the bottom of the building and that we want some kind of uh, uh, cap at the top. But also, the scale of, uh, of a crown like this is very similar to the scale of the base of the building and to the scale of surrounding buildings. So that echo of scale is important to us. Uh, this illustrates this uh, notion that we had about big buildings and medium buildings and low buildings. The level of detailing in the architecture is very similar and they're often working within a similar vocabulary. It's sort of like a musical composition where you're using themes that repeat and that's what makes it all hold together. And that's the fun of it, that's the fun of it. I mean, we, that's what we love to do. And, uh, and even, by the way, the, if we think about the, the scale of a tea house on the street, it's the same scale as, the, as one of these little balconies up here. So whether you have an apartment that's on the ground floor with your little tea house, or whether you have a penthouse with a terrace that's about the same size that will hold the same amount of furniture, there's a little bit of a sense of equality as to how the way, the way that people live in this village. And to us, that is a way of looking toward the future of urbanism. It's very helpful to go back and be able to use this tool and then eventually go through to that scale and see if it really works. So it's, it's, it's really back and forth process between the models and these 3D um, programs. We also study the details in what we call the shaft of the building. Um, so what you're seeing here is a typical bay window and then this is all made of metal and then the bottom of it's all sculpted limestone. So we look at all these details, how they relate to each other, how this makes the transition from this window to this bay window, this metal panel. The windows are really the place where the inside and the outside really come together. That's where the rubber hits the road and so to study those windows in very careful detail is very important. And we always put people in and these models had um, a ceiling so we could start to study the proportion and the scale of the openings in relation to the room. We like to create more special windows for more special locations. So here's an idea of a sort of larger uh, element with a French balcony. They're like individual houses stacked on each other, but they're all integrated to create a wonderful, iconic top. So it's like a landscape in the sky. When you're making a gesture so high in the sky, sometimes you do have to exaggerate the proportions. Michelangelo used to do this with, this, with his sculptures. He would exaggerate the head and the hands. So we, we think like that, like when we're designing a building, we have to like look out close and look at it from far away. What do you actually see in the skyline? So that's very important to us. So after we progress from the clay, then we get to a very rough model with just paper elevation. And here's another view of this model below because you can see we also do studies like this. Of course, we get down very low and look up the street, look down the street and really see what it looks like. And you can see in this model, at this point, we've really jumped to the next scale. And this model actually had another version where the elevations were completely flat. But again, to really understand things, you like to sculpt all of the detail where you have a loggia, where you have inset windows, where you have a, a very gentle setback. Um, like when you really build that level of detail, then you can really understand the texture and how it relates to the texture and the character and the elevations of the neighbors. So again, it's, it's drawing from the vocabulary of the neighborhood, but really um, creating a new place. You can see our historic neighbor, the women's club, to the right here, um, which um, has this beautiful, there's a light well, so there's a lower floor with light well windows. Um, we continue that idea all the way around with beautiful wrought iron railings that really tie the idea all the way around the square. And then careful attention to an idea of landscaping that relates to the way People have done it elsewhere in the neighborhood. Of course, we've studied it very closely. Looking up the street, you can see the rhythm and the scale of the neighboring houses and how we tried to relate the scale and character of what we've done here, again, so that it really feels like a continuum. You know, we like to feel that we've been able to really create a building that um, feels timeless, that feels like it fits in, makes its own statement, and it's a building of today, but growing out of the ideas of the place in the past.